Hello everyone and uh, welcome uh, and thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Roberta Yanna. I'm the co-chair of the Paris Committee of Capacity Building, the PCCB. And I would like to warmly welcome you to this event on uh, uh, greening uh, TVT, uh, technical and vocational education and training and skills development uh, to equip and capacitate future workforce uh, Workforce for a Just Transition. Uh, this event is jointly organized by the International Labour Organization, the ILO, in partnership with Rest for Africa Foundation under the PCCB network. And I'm delighted to see that uh, two distinguished members of the PCCB ne network are working together to create and facilitate a virtual dialogue by bringing um, prominent speakers uh, to share their practical insights on exploring the role of technical and vocational education and training and skills um, in a just transition. So before uh, we dive deeper into the theme of this event, uh, I'd like to quickly introduce you to P the PCCB and establish that COP21 in 2015, the Paris Committee on Capacity Building, the so-called PCCB, seeks to address uh, current and emerging uh, gap and needs uh, in implementing and further enhancing capacity building in developing countries. Its mission is to identify potential solutions uh, to address uh, such gaps and needs, uh, including enhancing the coherence and coordination of capacity building efforts related to climate change. And to learn more uh, um, about the PCCB, you are welcome to visit uh, the, the web page uh, under the UNFCCC website, and you should see the link uh, in the chat. Um, to support uh, the PCCB's mission and mandate, uh, the committee launched uh, the PCCB network back in 2020 as a voluntary association of interested stakeholders uh, engaged in climate-related capacity building. The PCCB network provides a platform to share information on best practice, uh, contributes to the work of the PCCB in fulfilling its mandate, and seeks to connect um, with its peers across sector and regions. And uh, as of today, the network unites uh, 382 organizations from 97 countries. So we are very, very happy and satisfied with that. And today we are particularly excited about the partnership between the International Labour Organization and Rest for Africa Foundation and their joint attempt to tackle pressing issues on skills development and just transition through this webinar. This collaboration uh, is a perfect example of the PCCB network's dedication uh, to facilitate sessions like this fostering collaboration and sharing knowledge to collectively advance capacity building efforts. Again, to learn more uh, about the PCCB network, uh, you can go on the website and you should find again the link uh, in the uh, chat uh, here. The theme today of the webinar is rooted in the understanding that the shift towards energy sustainability and the circular economy will generate significant job opportunities while also carrying the potential for job displacement. To ensure a seamless transition, the critical step is to invest in skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. So, TVET stands at the forefront of enabling this transformation. Today, the panelists and speaker, we have um, the speaker we will have uh, we will have with them an engaging and practical discussion on uh, why um, TVET is a crucial from for a just transition, addressing challenges, opportunities, and strategies for equipping the workforce with essential skills needed to drive just transition. And to conclude, let me uh, just provide you some information on housekeeping rules uh, to ensure we have a smooth session. So please feel free to use the Q&A function or uh, chat or the chat for any question. And the webinar will be recorded and later uploaded to the PCCB YouTube channel. The resources shared during this session and an outcomes uh, article will also be published on the event page. And after the event, we kindly request your cooperation in completing a post-event survey. Now, over to 
all over the Bira Aviola Awe, hope to um, have pronounced it uh, at least acceptably, uh, the Partnership and Regional Expansion Associate of Students and a member of Res for Africa Youth Task, Youth Task Force, who will be moderating this session. And I wish you all a very fruitful uh, uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Roberta. And yes, you did pronounce my name perfectly well. So thank you so much. And hello to everyone. Thank you for making the time to join today's webinar. My name is Olua Dabira and I am a member of the Youth Tax Force with Race for Africa. I've been serving for the last two years and supporting with the development of some of the foundation's priorities of which capacity and skill building um, is one of them. And just a quick note on Rest for Africa. Rest for Africa full acronym is Renewable Energy Solutions for Africa and um, we're a foundation that works to support Africa's just energy transition in order to achieve the SDG 7, ensuring affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. And we function as a bridge between Europe and Africa, gathering a network of members from all over the clean energy sector from both continents, that's Africa and Europe. Um, and high level international partnerships to ensure constant dialogue such as this between the most relevant energy stakeholders willing to mobilize investments in clean energy. And um, I just want to give you a summary of the um, agenda and the objectives of today's session. Um, a lot of it is focused on skills development in the context of TVET. And for those of us who don't know, like I did much, much uh, long ago, weeks ago, it means technical and education vocation. That's if you hear that throughout this uh, presentation or throughout the session, that's uh, what it means. And skills development is one of the key policy areas to address environmental, economic, and social sustainability. And the resolution and conclusions adopted by um, the 111th session of the ILO, that's the International Labour Conference, endorsed the ILO guidelines for a just transition towards and sustainable economies would include policy making and that's a basis of that was a basis of action in June 2023 and also we estimate that about 78 million jobs um, could be lost but there would also be a job creation of 103 million jobs globally by 2030 so of course you can see how important it is to um, discuss bridging these skill gaps and really getting ready for 2030 and the achievement of SDG 7. So in this light, um, TVET needs to anticipate and respond to the skill challenges needed for successful careers in low carbon and resource efficient economies and societies. And TVET systems in close partnership with social partners need to prepare their current and future learners for the energy transition. So without much, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mustafa Kamal Gwaye for the opening remarks. Mustafa is the director of um, Priority Action Program, Just Transitions Towards Environmental Sustainable Economies and Societies of the International Labour Organization. He was previously the global coordinator of the Green Jobs Program, and prior to joining ILO, he served as the head green economy advisory services of UNEP and senior program manager at the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development in Geneva. So the perfect person to open up this session and I would like to hand over to Mustafa. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair and, and Olga for, uh, for this opportunity to, to join the conversation. Uh, so first of all, please allow me to express our appreciation to the Paris Committee uh, on capacity building under the UNFCC and, and REST for Africa Foundation for, for this collaboration. This is highly important uh, to us. I want to share uh, three points that I hope will be useful in, uh, in having a, a good discussion this morning. Uh, so my first point, colleagues, is, is about climate ambition. You know, as we stand, we all know that we are far away from the objectives that uh, UNFCC parties and parties to the Paris Agreement have set to achieve as we head towards COP28 uh, in the United Arab Emirates, we realize that we are behind targets. This means that climate ambition is even more imperative today. But I want to stress that 
ambition is not just about the numbers that we have to achieve to keep 1.5 degree alive. Ambition is fundamentally about human capacity. It's only when we will have enterprises that are able to innovate, invest in new business models, when we will have workers able to produce goods and services that benefit people and the climate, and where communities will be able to transform and diversify their economies and societies that we will have that ambition possible. So therefore, what we are here about today is fundamentally about human capacity. Now, skills development is essential for that human capacity. And when we consider skills, we need to understand the different kinds of skills that are needed to transform the economy and society and labor markets. And I want to say that significant research and analysis, as well as policy experience, have pointed to the need and the importance of technical and vocational education and training, which is TVET, and that's the focus of our discussion today. So my second point is about what you said, all that the ecological transition will impact economies and societies, and particularly labor markets in different ways, both positively, but also negatively. There is going to be job and income gain in for some, but there is going to be some risk of dislocation, loss of employment and income for others. Now, how do we maximize the opportunity to catch those benefits of economic gain, income and job creation and minimize the risks of social dis disruption makes skills fundamental. You know, we need this, the skills to, to achieve those gains and minimize the risks. And, and as you said, there's a lot of analysis that tells us about those numbers that my colleague will come into more detail as we go in the discussion this morning. My third point, is about the imperatives of a just transition in this process. And there is again where skills development and, and TVET in particular will play a critical role. In the last assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC specifically stresses the importance of prioritizing equity, social justice, climate justice, and inclusion as enablers of both ambition, uh, ambition both for mitigation and adaptation. So now the key message that we get from the latest IPCC assessment is that the social and labor dimensions are no longer only a question of a core benefit that we will gain after having achieved climate action that we would get in addition to mitigation and adaptation, job creation, income growth. These social and labor related dimensions are in themselves enablers of actions. They come up front, they're not at the end of the process. And I think this latest message from the IPCC is fundamental uh, in rethinking the narrative on how to connect the climate agenda with the decent work and social policy. So, with that, I very much look forward to a very interactive discussion. I again, appreciate on behalf of the Iowa this opportunity to collaborate and to engage again with our youth constituency. So thank you so much and looking forward uh, to a, a change uh, this morning. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mustafa, for giving us that um, opening remarks. Definitely social and labor dimensions are no longer about the co-benefits, but are themselves enablers of action. So right now we'll be doing something um, interesting and it is an online poll um, and that would be moderated by myself as well as the UNFCCC. So um, I would just like everyone on the call, if you can, to, there's a link that was just posted in the chat. It's a Mentimeter link and that's where we can find the poll. We just, we're just asking a few questions just to um, get an understanding of everyone's um, perspectives and opinions coming from the different places on this greening TVT and skills development. So if you're there, just, you know, maybe pop a wave, maybe just put a thumbs up. Um, but if you're not there, 
um, you can just weave. So, okay, amazing. So what is the biggest challenge that your country faces for greening TVET and skills development? We have skill, skills gap and funding, lack of funding and ecosystem, funding and private sector engagement, investment, poverty, collaboration between public, private sector, social dialogue and coordination, funding and sector engaging, skills gap, no sustainable system for lifelong learning, lack of funding. So we are seeing a lot of overlaps, lack of funding, skills gap, investment, resources, lack of human capacity. lack of policy skills mismatch long processes okay so we'll just give it a, a minute more or two minutes more just so everybody can get their answers in no dedicated frameworks and systems approach most jobs are up and activities are still conventional political will that's a very important one um, especially in to some of the heavy fossil fuel producing com um, countries. Proper coordination between, thank you, Shilendra. Lack of specific programs. Okay, awesome. This, these are great answers, very insightful. Inconsistencies with other policies such as trade and investment. So, what were some of the most common answers we are seeing here? Policy, investment, that's funding, um, skills gap, um, skills mis mismatch. Um, oh, this is a new one lack of knowledge of opportunities that exist in the green transition. That's very important too because there could be opportunities, but you know, people are not aware. Or in some cases, it could be that they just think that they don't have the skills to access those opportunities. So thank you. All right, so maybe we move on to the next question. What is the biggest, what is your suggestion to increase the relevance of TVET in the context of a just transition? So we'd like to hear from you. What do you think, what is your recommendation to increase the relevance of TVET? in the context of a just transition. More resources should be allocated. Perfect, more funding. Engage private sector. Innovative engagements clearly sharing about greening TVTs and the impact. Okay, establish learning and communicating communities, regions and countries in one sustainable world. Capacity building at the individual, very important, institutional and systemic level. Engaging industry and workers. Public-private academia partnership to eliminate skill gap. Bringing training providers, employers and workers organizations together in green TVT. So we're seeing a lot of suggestions on collaboration um, with the different sectors in different spaces understanding and commitment of the different stakeholders. So I'm supposing that that's um, government, private sector, academia, the trainers, the learners, create awareness, increase funding and make changes in TVT policies. So all of these are directly tackling some of the barriers that we mentioned at the beginning, policies. Um, so there needs to be a reform of policies, awareness, collaboration, tailored to local social economic context and build on existing practices of just transition. Hmm. Make needed skills publicly known. That's, that seems like a direct solution to not being aware of the opportunities available in, in the greening, in greening TV, the sector. Need collaboration, collaboration again, 
professional development of educators and upgrading of qualifications and curricula, creation of innovative labs, interesting. Dedicated skills frameworks at national level, which can guide action and sectoral approach. Okay, so maybe just give 30 seconds more so everyone can get their suggestions in. Well, thank you all. These are great suggestions, very practical suggestions. Provide seed grants for startups. Okay, so I think we can wrap up the poll. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking time to answer. That was um, that was such a deep dive to see um, everyone's perspectives, everyone's suggestions, and these are why we have some of the, some of these kind of platforms, just so we can hear from different um, people and um, see how we can collaborate and rub minds to move forward. So thank you so much. Right now, we're going to be having a presentation on greening TV, T, and skills development by. Hai Kyung Chon and um, Hai Kyung is a technical officer at the Skills and Employability Branch Employment Policy Department of the International Labour Organization in Geneva. And her work area focuses on skills need, needed to anticipate the future of work, skills for environmental sustainability and climate action, and skills for technological change and Digital, digitalization. And of course, before joining the ILO, she worked at the OECD Development Center and Korean delegation to the OECD in Paris. Um, and she also has work experience at the Embassy of Rwanda in Seoul. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to welcome the next presenter. Right, let me put it on the screen, the screen mode. I hope you can see my screen. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will have a very short presentation on our Greening TVAD and Skills Development tool. Um, before I go into the details of the tool, I would like to first of all give you a little bit of background on the birth of this tool. So in 2019, the ILO has uh, produced a global research on skills for a greener future uh, and it showed that um, the job creation will outpace job destruction in the green transition by 2030. And we looked into the impact on employment by gender, by occupation, and also at the, by at the different skills level. As you can see on the slides, uh, all occupations will be changing in one way or another in the context of green transition. And, and um, that means that greening education and training at all levels would be crucial to make this uh, transition possible. On top of that, the projection shows that there will be a higher demand for higher skilled occupations and the most turnover will be happening at medium skilled occupations. And this does have the great implication for technical and vocation education, the TVET level. So indeed, greening TVET and skills development is vital to tackle the climate and environmental challenges. And it can also support the green transformation. But not only that, the TVET can be in the lead uh, seat for, the, for transforming, for leading the green transformation by equipping the workforce with the relevant skills, knowledge, and mindsets so that they can bring the changes in their workplaces, community, and society as a whole. So with that in mind, um, we have identified the key elements for greening TVET and skills development. To mainstream skills uh, for green transition in TVET, we would need to adapt competency standards and curricula that's tuned to the industry needs which should be based on solid skills needs anticipation and that curricula has effectively to be delivered at the training level and it has to be assessed effectively as you can see on the in the middle of the circle and for an effective training delivery and assessment the capacity of teachers and trainers are important that they need to have up-to-date knowledge skills and right method to um, deliver the training and also to assess the trainees and students. It is also important to have a physical environment, the learning environment such as campus and the schools that are conducive to raise environmental awareness and behaviors. 
And also sensitizing enterprises in this process to be engaged is important that they are the one who can inform what's going on in the labor market and inform about the skills demand for the education and training providers. And it's where the trainees and students will be able to practice their practical skills that they acquired from education and training. We also need to look at it from a wider system level. The governance, including monitoring and evaluation, funding and social dialogue are important elements for greening TVET and skills development. And this is very much normative and policy process with, which has to be implemented with a holistic and systematic approach with a long term view. And however, um, our studies based on 32 countries studies show that TVET systems in many countries still face various challenges and constraints in general terms, meaning that it also affects their greening agenda. So hence, we thought we saw this kind of gap between what to do and how to do at the TVET level to be to respond to better respond to the green transition. Uh, and the tool was developed to support countries from national to local level, involving various uh, stakeholders from policymakers, social partners, employers, teachers, and trainers, and civil society. The tool aimed not only just to green TVET, but also to upgrade the structures and processes more widely, linking to wider social and economic greening strategies. And we have uh, 10 different how to sections in this TVET tool, and it goes around the key elements that I have mentioned in earlier slides. So we have how to sections on designing competency standard for green jobs, curricula, training, assessment, and how to go about it for a greening campus and the greening professional development of teachers and trainers, and also how we can sensitize enterprise to be on board and greening TVET process. And also as in middle and uh, low and middle income countries, informal economy is important. We also have a section on how we can support greening of skills for the informal economy. Last but not least, mainstreaming would be also important. So we have a section on how we can go about from the piloting to the whole system. So the content uh, itself, uh, in each section, we start with the learning point, and then we go to the content uh, where we provide different alternatives, options, and methods and mechanisms that can be used in different contexts with the practical examples from different countries. And at the end of each section, we have self-assessment tool, hints and tips and checklists and useful resources that can help the uh, TV stakeholders to take stock of where they stand and come up with an area for their improvement. Due to time constraint, I won't be able to go in details for each section, but just to give you a little bit of flavor by zooming into the section on designing competency standard for greener jobs. So as I mentioned, it starts with the key learning points. And in this section, you will learn how to how competency standards can support the green transition and what that means for skills and what are the different types of mechanisms for assessing skills for green jobs and what are the different content and methods for that. And then we normally have a list of key stakeholders that should be involved in designing competency standards um, from policymakers up to teachers and trainers. Um, this is, of course, not an exhaustive um, list. And then the contents part comes in that we uh, we try to illustrate uh, what are the existing process and method in different countries and what can you take as a step. So it's a full of um, a graphical representation of different activities. So for competency standard, you will need to look into the labor market. What are the needs for skills? How does that affect for occupations? And we recommend to look into the existing process and methodology that already exists in your country. And then that would, uh, uh, with, uh, with a different methodology, and process that lead up to the writing competency standards and curriculum. And then we also have different examples. Uh, in this competency standard chapter, we have an example from FOIL project, which was um, the ILO supported the technical support on um, for the regional network of TVET institutions in Central, uh, in, uh, Central America. And um, this is an example of uh, one unit of competence for um, organic producer and how that translates into learning outcomes and into the curriculum. And the ILO supported for adapting learning um, standards and curriculum for different eight um, occupations. 
And then at the end of the section, it ends with uh, different hints and tips for the key elements for designing competency standards for greener jobs. And then a reflection space, which keys questions. And this has been quite helpful for the key stakeholder um, consultation that it helps people to, to learn where they stand and also try to find an area where they need to improve. And we also have been piloting this tool in different countries, such as Ghana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Cambodia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And piloting activities range from support measures to coaching programs. So for example, in Ghana, the tool was used to support sector skills bodies, 12 dif different sector skills bodies, to take stock of where they stand um, on skills anticipation and their involvement in greening TVET and how they can support better so, so to come up with an action plan. And in case of Zimbabwe, the tool arrived after they had already developed five new curriculum, green curriculum, focusing on renewable energy and um, smart agriculture. So the tool was used to capacitate the teachers and trainers so that they can better deliver the new curriculum. In case of Cambodia, Thailand, and the Philippines, tailor-made coaching program was provided. So it was to support them on how to use this tool actually, and also to capacitate the key stakeholders through learning by doing. So mostly they chose uh, priority occupation and uh, priority sectors, and we want to see their existing competency standard and curriculum together and try to bring um, green transition aspect into the existing um, curriculum and competency standard. So this tool is very much action oriented. It's very flexible that you don't have to go through A to Z. So you can, depending on your context, depending on your needs, you can choose and pick and each section can be used uh, independently and holistic process-based approach uh, is uh, provided that we deal systematically with all TVET elements. And we also have various different ILO tools and products that can support and inform greening TVET and skills development. So feel free to check this out on our website. It's available and uh, yeah, more countries are joining for piloting this uh, greening TVET tool. So feel free to reach out to us uh, if you're interested and if you'd like to know more about it. So this comes to the end of my presentation and over to you, Loa Davida. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Hai King, for the presentation. Um, just to just going now straight to any questions that you have for this presentation will be taken afterwards. So right now, I just want to hand over the um, the presentation to the next speaker, and we're going to have be having our next session. So without much further ado, um, handing over to Olga. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and I would like to welcome the participants. Good morning, good, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Olga Strieska. I come from the ILO Implement Policy Department as well, uh, leading the work area on skill strategies for future labor markets. So naturally, we also look uh, in my team at the skill needs uh, for a greener future and climate action. Um, we have a panel discussion, so we have uh, roughly half an hour, um, a little bit, maybe 35 minutes, uh, 40 minutes maximum to uh, discuss uh, how uh, greening technical vocational education and training and skills development, that means including reskilling, upskilling, uh, active labor market policy solutions and capacitating uh, future workforce can help uh, the just transition. Uh, we have four panel speakers. I would like to welcome them and to thank them to, to come uh, and join us uh, in the discussion. Uh, we have Manuela Gelenk from European Commission, Wouter Zweizen from European um, uh, Trade Union Institute. We have Robert Marinkovic from the International Organization of Employers and uh, Roberto Vigotti from REST for Africa Foundation. So everybody is here. Welcome. Um, I would like to uh, shape this discussion about going a little bit deeper. We have already heard about some challenges and the whole importance uh, of technical vacation education training, skilling and um, upskilling in raising the climate ambition. Um, we also heard already about some solutions and there, there were 
it was a poll with participants where some solutions have been named in the measures. So here I would like to go a little bit deeper into this question, also from the different angles of, you know, donor, civil society, employees, workers. That's what we're going to do. So the first uh, question I have is to uh, Manuela. So Manuela Gelling is coming from the European Commission, where she's the director for jobs and skills in the Director Generate for Employment, Social Affairs and, and Inclusion. And she is actually responsible for the future of work file as well as youth employment and the implementation of the skills agenda and vocational education training policies. So Manuela, well, I know that we're basically all well coming closer to an end, or maybe we're we're quite advanced, let's say, in, in the year, in the European year of skills. Uh, it's a celebration, but it's also a big uh, commitment of European Commission to develop skills, including for just transition. I'm sure you have mapped uh, the challenges and the needs. So my first question is really around the measures, how to support Tibet institutions and help them to meet uh, and make them more relevant to the labor market needs uh, for the green and just transition in the European Union. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good morning and good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, yes, in the European Union, as you certainly know, uh, the, we have a Green Deal, which is actually our um, policy framework for achieving climate uh, neutrality. And there uh, we all know Compared to what you, you have been saying, I think we are in the same boat. You will not be surprised by our figures either. Uh, we, we, we think that the transition to the green, um, the, the green transition can bring new jobs uh, between 1 million and 2.5 million for Europe uh, by 2030. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, that means that we need to have a a labor force that has the right uh, right skills. Um, because it's clear that there will be some jobs that will be disappearing, some new jobs that will be emerging, and some jobs will change their, their tasks. So the, the, the issue about upskilling and reskilling, which is actually front and center uh, of the European skills, is precisely about focusing on, on the technical skills that we'll be needing, but also the more broader transversal uh, skills. So specifically um, on vocational education and training uh, in the European Union, we um, have um, a policy framework about vocational education and training, which is set out in a recommendation adopted by uh, the member states which uh, sets out as one of the key objectives the, uh, to facilitate the green and the digital transitions. And there, what we have been doing uh, is that member states have now been preparing implementation plan on how to implement a future-proof vocational education and training. We are going to discuss that in December. Uh, we will have a very thorough discussion on how to take this forward. In the meanwhile, um, we have set up a working group of member states that have been discussing good practices in green, in the green skills, in the vocational education and training uh, context. And they have come up also with the, with the guidance, which very much, if you have a look at it, it very much reflects what you have just set out uh, in, the, in the presentation. So you will find the same issues out there with a lot of uh, best practices that member states, our member countries have shared, uh, because it's clear that we are all in the same boat. And uh, if we can learn from each other and be faster in uh, uh, adapting to this transition, it will be benef the benefit for everyone because uh, the clear objective here is that the green transition is a fair one that leaves no one behind. And for that, we need to make sure that everyone has the skills to master this, uh, these changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuela. And just to fo a follow up question, uh, given uh, 
how high on the agenda skills now come in the framework of European Year of Skills. How can we build on this momentum? Uh, and uh, what what are your further plans and way forward beyond the European Year uh, of Skills to advance the just transition agenda and social inclusion? Oh, that's a, a it's a big question because we are actually only a few months into the year. As you know, the European Year of Skills will last until uh, May next uh, next year. So. Uh, what we are really focusing on is to to um, to strengthen the momentum of the year. It's about changing the mindset. So it's not just about in. It's about making sure that everyone has the right skills, that upskills or reskills if necessary. And this, the focus is really on the adult population, the adult workforce, because they will be the most affected by these changes. Um, and uh, and that we need them because, as you may know, in, in the European Union, we have uh, a lot of labor shortages in many sectors, many of which are in vocational education and, and training. And uh, we have the same figures you just showed that most of the jobs in the green transition that will require green skills are technical jobs, vocational education and training uh, jobs. So uh, the year is about changing the mindset that you have to learn exactly what you said, that um, uh, skills are uh, not a destination, are a journey. So it's a journey for life. And at the same time, pushing for implementation. We have set a target that ev uh, every year uh, by 2030, um, 60% of adults should participate in training. It's a, it's an important target because uh, we we don't have yet this deep-rooted culture of upskilling and reskilling in Europe. At the same time, the focus is not just about changing the mindset; it's also about implementation. And there we have a number of initiatives we want to deepen. First of all, we have. Uh, um, an initiative on individual learning account, uh, which means that allowing that uh, each adult has a personal budget through which it can access training. So to entice uh, working people to, to, to train more. This is an initiative we are um, that some member states are taking up and that we are co-funding through the European uh, Social Fund uh, in uh, in uh, some countries. Another one is the Pact for Skills, where we join forces between public authorities, social partners, uh, companies, public employment authorities to create partnerships for upskilling and reskilling across economic value chains, and particularly those that we have mentioned here that are important for the green and the digital uh, transitions. And then uh, another very important initiative in the field of vocational education and training are uh, centers of vocational excellence. So where TVET institutions come together on specific topics um, to improve share their best practices and improve the provision of vocational uh, education and uh, and training. So there are lots of initiatives ongoing. Our focus during the year is really to promote implementation because that's what we need. For the time being, we have 37% um, only of all adults that take upskilling and reskilling. So there is a big gap to reach the 60%. And that's why implementation is so, so crucial. And that's why also uh, we need to change the mindsets that skills are a destination, uh, are, a, <laughs> are a journey, not a destination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuela. Yeah, I very much agree with you. It's really a journey, not a destination, but it's uh, 
really admirable that you set up the ambition so high, achieving the 60% of participation and continuing vacation training among, among adults. And also, I, I can only uh, stress that we have very similar priorities around the world, also looking at some innovation in, in funding of lifelong learning, including individual learning accounts, uh, but also working with the European Union in some countries, building the Pact for Skills, for example, in Ghana, and the vocational uh, centers for vocational excellence, for example, in Bangladesh. Uh, so with this, uh, I would move forward with um, the next uh, speaker, who is Vatras Weizen. Uh, he's a senior researcher at European Trade Union Institute, where he works on issues of labor market inequalities and labor market trends, in particular looking at migration and mobility, wage inequality, and the future of work. So Walter, the first question comes to you. Uh, we all heard about skills shortages, shortages, particularly Manuel and I mentioned in the European Union, but skills shortages and labor shortages are actually quite acute around the world, especially also in the context of, uh, of the uh, just transition, green transition. So what are the major, major challenges uh, you will identify from the workers' perspective in attracting workers with the right skills to the jobs? Um, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, you can hear me well? Good. So I, I'm Wouter and I'm at the European Trade Union Institute. On, I was asked to join by the International Trade Union Confederation. That has two uh, repercussions. One, I will speak more from a European perspective than the international. And two, I do not represent the social partners myself. Um, so what I'm saying here is not the position of ETUC necessarily or other trade unions. So with that disclaimer out of the way, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to explain these questions or to go into these questions. Uh, I, I found it very interesting already from the previous speaker. But indeed, I think it's very clear, also from a worker perspective, that there is a need for upskilling and reskilling of workers, given these large transitions and given, as you said, the big creation and destruction of jobs. At the moment, however, we're still very far from having a lot of people in training. And this is also the case, as, as uh, Director Galeng also highlighted, this is also the case in some of the sectors that uh, will be most affected. So a first thing I think is important is that there should be more training for those uh, workers in those sectors that are heavily affected by the shortages and by the transitions to come. And that the training needs to be uh, needs to be appropriate and, and applicable to all workers. So I think there a second thing is that we still often see when we look at survey data a difference in who gets training and it's more the uh, workers on more secure contracts, um, often they're already more highly educated and it's not always available to everyone. One important way to uh, go beyond that and to make sure the training is appropriate for the skills that are required is to involve the social partners. Uh, both the trade unions, but the employers as well. And uh, as I think the, the uh, director also mentioned previously, using things like training funds or, or collective agreements and collective bargaining can be a way forward here to really try to make the most of this and then get workers ready. Um, and then I think it's also important that we are talking of skills mismatches and those definitely exist, but there's this much wider context of labor shortages we're facing right now. And these are not only in the more highly skilled or even uh, technical vocationally skilled uh, occupations, but there's also shortages of many lower skilled uh, positions or positions that would require some training. And there I think it's important that we make a distinction between where the skills mismatches exist and where there are shortages of workers, mainly because the job quality is too low. So we see that also from international research, from some research we've done, that shortages are also much higher in sectors with relatively lower pay, relatively worse conditions. And that is one crucial thing I think that is not often talked about that is the jobs that need to be created need also to be of good quality. They need to attract workers there. Often these skills mismatches are used as a way, especially when we're talking the European perspective, to um, open the gate for more labor migration and, and to say we need more workers with skills because they don't exist at the moment. And that might be seen as a shortcut to providing training yourselves or uh, to providing training to workers. While there's no issue with labor migration itself, it is a problem. Um, in two ways, it can be an issue. One, a lot of the skills shortages that exist, exist in almost all countries. So if you uh, import more workers with specific skills, in some 
specific occupations are going to exacerbate problems. Um, that is already a, a worry in some of the Central and Eastern European countries. On a global scale, this will be bigger. Um, and then a second issue is that in many of the European labor markets, we still see very much that migrant skills are not used to the fullest. So that's the second part. Uh, very important to have skilled migrants for this to enable the transition, but then we need to make use of, of their skills and not, um, not have them on the scale for, for the jobs. So to conclude my response on this, I think there's a need for offering sufficient and tailored training on the job to all workers and decide with the workers and the social partners. And there is a need for these jobs to be of sufficient quality to attract workers. Um, so that's my response to this discussion. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Walter. And just um, a follow up question. So you mentioned um, the the importance of engagement of workers and also the, the provision of, of uh, skills training, which is really relevant to their needs. Uh, that may potentially promote uh, skills development, and lifelong learning, including some measures that recognize the, the available skills, including those of migrant workers. So what, what opportunities and biggest challenges you see to mobilize and prepare trade unions in that process, trade union members? So I think the big opportunity there really comes from the fact that together with the employers, trade unions and, and employees have very specific knowledge on what skills are needed, specifically at the workplace. And, and that can be utilized much more, I think. And that's the big benefit of having these training funds and social partners administrating the training. Um, and that's where the big opportunities lie. There is, however, also a need to train uh, trade union representatives on the work, shop floor representatives, specifically on these issues so they can help uh, co-workers and they can help um, the, the establishment in the workplace. And then finally, I think that the big challenge is partly compositional in we've heard here talk about jobs being destroyed, jobs being created, uh, and it's going all rather fast and, and it will have a big impact. And almost all jobs that are not uh, destroyed or created will be replaced, uh, will be changed in some way and transformed in some way. But at the moment, there is um, a difference in the extent to which workers are represented and have their voices heard between these different sectors. So, what is a risk, I think, is that uh, many of the sectors, the more polluting sectors where big transformations have to happen, also have relatively high union density, good collective agreements, good collective uh, bargaining. And a lot of the new jobs are often in smaller enterprises. I mean, obviously, I'm uh, generalizing to some extent, but in, in average, as you can see this, and don't have the same sort of protections always built in. So I think the very important point is when we're looking at job quality, we also need to think of the worker representation and um, the other aim the European Commission has to reach more collective bargaining, we do need to keep that in mind and also think of what sort of jobs are being created and do they provide the same opportunities and the same protections for workers. Um, and I will stop there and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Walter. Um, this is yeah, this is extremely useful. Also, when we look actually at the potential uh, transitions on on the labor market due to implementation of climate policies and due to uh, policies and measures taken upon environmental degradation, we see of course there will be a lot of job opportunities, but job losses equally. However, uh, for those people who, who lose the jobs are usually appearing opportunities in the in the newly created or green jobs or those jobs that are changing. But uh, definitely uh, that is a big question whether these uh, new jobs uh, would be of a relevant quality with the relevant protection. For the ILO, for example, when we say green jobs, actually we, we um, think that this also should be decent jobs. So it's not only the environmental aspect, but also the social protection aspect, uh, the right to, to organize, to collective bargaining and so on. And we always underline that actually uh, the opportunities to reskill and upskill uh, should be part of the collective bargaining process. This is what is uh, always underlined by our uh, constituents on, uh, on the worker side, but also agreeable by uh, the employer side. So with this, I actually would move to the next speaker who represents uh, the employee side. Uh, so uh, Robert Marinkovic is an advisor in the International Organization of Employers. He uh, works on climate change 
policy issues in the IOE, uh, also on the sustainable development goals, the green economy and just transition. Um, uh, since 2018, and he's coordinating also his uh, all work of the IOE with um, on, on on just transition and sustainability issues with other international uh, organizations. Um, so, Robert, um, one the first question which comes to you, which is maybe a little bit similar to the previous discussion, but from the uh, employers and businesses perspective perspective. Uh, we Many people actually underline the importance of engaging with, uh, with the private sector. What challenges do businesses see in engaging with vacation education training uh, to advance the green and just transition agenda? Hi, thank you, Olga. Thank you for the question and for having me here today. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been a, it's been an interesting discussion so far. Many many valid and good points already have been brought up. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, I would like to highlight the the, the complexity and broad scope um, of these types of questions. And um, when we're looking at the global level, it's uh, you know it's hard to generalize. Um, I think one of the most important points, first of all, is the importance of the of the national context and the, the the different challenges or particular um, issues that can be faced you know based on the based on the labor market and the national economy um, but also the sec the sector i think um, in, in our experience the the sectoral approach can be quite useful because when you start looking at specific sectors you start seeing um, some of the issues and challenges more clearly <clears throat> i would say you know as an one of the overarching challenges, obviously, especially when it comes to engagement specifically, is that um, in many in many cases, in many places, this is a relatively you know um, a relatively new agenda, uh, um, a kind of fast-moving dynamic, and often there is a bit of a lack of coordination mechanisms, right? So many companies don't really you know um, engage specifically and directly with uh, education and training institutions or there isn't a, a, an overarching uh, you know strategy or, or framework at the national level which would facilitate this and um, at ioe we definitely see this as a as an opportunity for employers organizations for our members and um, and an area where organizations like employers and business member membership associations could um, have a larger role to play right sometimes for a single company it's difficult to to have the capacity and the resources to to you know analyze current uh, dynamics and future ones and anticipate um, these kinds of things so it, it would be useful to collaborate more with you know sectoral or trade trade associations and establish um, dedicated frameworks and channels for communicating between employers and education and training institutions and you know there are already some good examples of this and some countries are um, kind of more advanced or have more experience with this already um, one of the good examples we have is with our indian member with the confederation of indian industry where they have a, a national level council for for green jobs which puts together um, the employers with <clears throat> government and training and, and um, vocational education institutions. Um, but on, on, a, on a general level, I mean, you know, one of the challenges is um, having this capacity to analyze and monitor the current evolution and needs um, of skills. Um, and then the second step, obviously, is you know developing those skills and and uh, having them. Um, available where and when they're needed and then the third level is kind of the the future um, and anticipation and um, be enabling enabling future development right some of our members for example when they're looking at you know developing their um, renewable energy industry or or different sectors they they obviously admit that at at the current stage there's not enough there's a kind of mismatch or a shortage at the national level so there's also the component of for example importing skills or importing the the necessary workforce which was mentioned a little bit um apologies about the bell in the background um 
but also the issue is that it's often it, there is a, a need for a kind of systems approach, right? A need for developing new business models <clears throat> and um, and ensuring that uh, these things move together, right? If um, if only one company in the national market is uh, you know getting into the development of uh, uh, solar panels, for example, they they will probably be able to find um, relevant workers. But if if um, all of a sudden there's a hundred companies doing the same thing, perhaps the system is not quite ready for that yet. Um, and it's a kind of a circular issue, right? Because maybe two years ago, the education institutions didn't expect that there would be a hundred companies looking for this type of worker. Once these companies are doing that, the, the the workers aren't there yet. So then they maybe fail, and then the, the demand goes away. So there needs to be this kind of coordination loop between the different elements of the system to ensure that uh, the progression can actually happen. Um, and then, um, like like Wouter also mentioned, you know, sometimes it's a little bit tricky with the transition between existing jobs and the new jobs because. Um, sometimes there's issues of job quality or, or um, you know, um, labor representation. For example, you know, fossil fuel industry jobs are often actually quite high quality jobs because uh, they have good benefits, they have good salaries. So if you tell workers that, you know, um, the, the regional coal power plant will be decommissioned and now they have to transition into other jobs, which perhaps might not be as well uh, um, compensated there might be some resistance to that so there needs to be you know dialogue there needs to be a sort of plan in place um so i think you know some of some of those issues um definitely exist but i think there's also a lot of good examples and a lot of uh, best practices out there already that we can learn from and that we can we can scale up um the the one of the most important elements for us is that there is a you know there is a dedicated framework and dedicated uh, process in place to 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 tackle these issues thank you so much uh robert could you maybe just very very briefly give an example of what o, uh, ioe does actually in promoting this linkage between tvet and uh employees private sector yeah, definitely. So for those who are, you know, not not familiar, um, the International Organization of Employers is a, is a membership based organization that operates at the global level. We're headquartered in Geneva um, with our secretariat, but we have over 140 members who are national employers organizations. And our members um, are representative at the national level and are uh, um, involved in, in policy making and um, on the one hand, working with their members on, on different um, employment and labor issues, and on the other hand, working with the government and other partners on, on um, promoting the priorities of the members and also ensuring that things like, you know, for example, green skills are, um, are taken um, into account. So for IOE, we have basically, you know, two types of functions, I would say, in this context. One, one is um, we try to um bring the you know priorities and challenges that our members are experiencing to discussions like this one and um, ILO discussions um different UN processes um and ensure that you know the 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 messages from the employers are heard for example you know at, uh, at the European level I've seen already a couple of uh, um, projects and and studies from trade associations highlighting shortages when it comes to particular sectors like you know electricity workers or um, automobile workers and things like that so there are industry groups that are you know raising these issues and it's our job to 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 amplify that and to highlight those um, those challenges on the other hand we um, we work with our members to ensure that they understand the 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 the, the ongoing dynamics and the needs um, that come from the international level and and the importance of working on these issues and ensuring that um, there is skills anticipation so currently for example we have an ongoing project in least developed countries um, in partnership with microsoft on developing digital skills where we're training um, um, workers in spe specific countries in collaboration with local TVET institutions. Um, we've recently launched a so-called Employers Alliance for Green Skills, where we um, incentivize and try to promote closer collaboration between our local members and their government on green skills to ensure that there is a dialogue at first of all, and second of all, a kind of um, framework that um, starts developing solutions. 
Um, and third of all, we try to establish, you know, collaboration and discussion between um, institutions like uh, like UNITAR or the um, International Telecommunications Union and employers on the ground to to promote some of these messages and where possible implement specific projects. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, it's impressive the the list of activities you have. Uh, you are one of our biggest allies uh, in promoting green skills. So I can only support uh, further development also for our collaboration on skills anticipation uh, with IOE, but also with uh, International Trade Union Confederation. Um, anticipation of the delivery of skills and the great engagement of both workers and employers in the whole process. So with this, uh, let me move now to uh, the Res Africa Foundation, Roberta Vigotti, uh, who is the Secretary General of the Res for Africa Foundation, uh, with more than 30 years of experience in NL. Uh, well, he joined in uh, 2012 uh, the Res for Africa Foundation to pr promote renewable energy. Uh, in Africa, something much needed there, but he is also the representative um, of Italy in the Renewable Working Party for the International Energy Agency and a member also of International Renewable Energy Agency. So naturally, my question to you, Roberto, uh, is what are the key enabling policies and factors to support particularly young people in just energy transition. So let's look at the sectoral examples and sectoral approaches have been mentioned by many as very useful. Thank you so much, Olga, for the question. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I think I can uh, shortly add some value because we, I represent mostly private sector. We have uh, 32 companies uh, um, from nine European countries and South Africa at the moment uh, working on accelerating investment, not only in renewable, but also in the infrastructure for power system transformation. Our motto is uh, electrification, scaling up electrification will try to solve many of the problems. Two years ago, we produced this little booklet, which is done with UNECA and with uh, IRINA. You can download from our website and shows uh, our analysis on the social economic benefits of uh, uh, transition and of course a lot of dedicated to uh, renewable uh, young people. We believe that uh, even though we have also because we are private sector, we need uh, to consider not only youth but young entrepreneur as essential component of the Africa sustainable energy future. I think young people now today have all the instruments and we, if not we have to give them more instruments to be equal partners of course for uh, shaping the future of the transition. If I can summarize in three main points, uh, our action is a capacity building, of course, uh, uh, finance and innovation, and most important, uh, meaningful engage and uh, involve the youth, which is not uh, always uh, very clear to private sector level. In capacity building, we do training and knowledge sharing uh, in Africa. Uh, maybe later I can also have time to show you how. And uh, we want to be sure to educate youth uh, uh, to be a protagonist of the change. So we have uh, tailored programs of business, uh, soft skill, innovation, challenge, and so on. Again, I underline that all this is done together with private sector. So this academia blend with the private sector will tell you the two story, the story of theory and the story of how in, uh, a concerned investor can really um, impact uh, Africa and why they can also um, for the youth involvement, not only for their own interest, but for the overall development. The second one, of course, is uh, financing and innovation. We think that unfortunately, young people should be uh, supported by scaling up the collaboration with the industry. And uh, we do um, have a lot of programs to enhance this issue. I think that we need more specialized uh, financial, business, and technical support for the business and also. Uh, to foster the, the way they can really uh, allow, be allowed to, to become a, really, a, a real player. This has been done already in the banking system, in the telecom, and not yet much in the energy sector. And again, uh, um, the collaboration with private sector is essential. We do acknowledge that our specific programs are well um, uh, appreciated because of the blend I said before. And finally, what is most important to me, a meaningful engage and involve youth. As you know, we have, um, by the way, uh, the, the Vida is one of them, 
we have a task force collecting 15 uh, uh, leaders from different networks to collaborate with the private sector and to say really to comment, to be part of the advisory board, to be part of the strategy discussion, so they really can highlight for uh, us uh, uh, the needs that will accelerate the uh, us. So our task force, and by the way, I want to thank uh, uh, Maria Caterina next to me. She is the one who made uh, this happen. Uh, always we, behind the men, always uh, women, usually the mama, in this case, is Caterina. Caterina made a wonderful job in putting together in just one year this task force, and again, that is one of them, and we look forward to host them in a few weeks in Roma for the youth uh, challenge. So again, uh, uh, empower the, the, the young people, and sometimes I still insist with them, the accelerating the transition is not only a problem of environment, not all, it's not only a problem of uh, um, the industry, it's a problem of having the young African not left behind while their peer level in India, in Japan, in China, in, in America make progress because of the possibility of having a, a visit there. So it's only a problem of avoiding that they are cut off from the progress, the other uh, young people there. So uh, we are fully committed and please uh, um, take a look at our website, you find everything there. We just maybe have a very short, super short follow-up question. If you would like to give some examples, more examples yeah. on the rest of really for good. Africa activities sure. uh, for vocational now? education training. Yes. Okay. I'll give you an example. First of all, you can download again, sorry to be blunt, this is a brochure on our academy. Here you have all the details of our training. But let me mention two issues. The first one is the so-called technical and vocational school. We do do we do in Kenya base uh, a vocational training for young uh, African together with Stratemore University, Santi Zito Vocational Training, RC Foundation, the Kenya Power Light, and we do train these people for two weeks uh, at a time uh, on how to become a designer, uh, uh, builder, and operator of a mini grid system and uh, of course a standalone system. So far, we have been training 1,800 young people, professional, from 45 countries, online, of course, some of them only. So to, to us, this was called Microgrid Academy, now it's becoming vocational school, and we now are um, proposing to Stratum University to be the owner of this brand. But we are very proud that this has been a success story. So uh, next uh, issue will be soon. Uh, if you go on our website, you find the call for application. Second one I love to mention is another issue, reskilling lab is called. In South Africa, as you know, there is a transition from coal to more clean sources, and the ESCOM company, and not only ESCOM, but NetBank and other, are doing a tremendous effort to converge, to transform the skill of the coal people into renewable uh, issue. And again, Reds for Africa has been asked to be part of the team who will uh, in uh, favor the, the, the skill transition. And the Skilling Lab is a very important program. I think uh, also the European Investment Bank, I see a lot of are interested because it's a flagship um, effort to uh, support young people. And we do trainers and, and we train trainers as well to make sure that uh, we have uh, the security that the, rest, uh, the South Africa will uh, really go faster today. So the Skilling Lab and the vocational training are the two main issues we made to you. But don't forget the executive school in Milano. We have uh, two weeks uh, next uh, November in Milano for 40 top le level people from agency university. And they are uh, one week in the Bocconi University, you know, very famous economic one, and one uh, week in the um, Polytechnic. So both uh, are giving to these people a two weeks uh, uh, scholarship to present it. So I think we have a variety again of uh, uh, programs. And I think again, since the beginning, Red for Africa believes that uh, sharing, not training only, sharing information and creating, uh, I mean, quality work added the value for free. We don't sell anything. We are a non-profit organization. Of course, our members do, but not us. So welcome to go to our website and take a look at our call for action in these two things. I hope it was uh, fast enough for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the super telegraphic answers and uh, definitely very useful youth, uh, youth entrepreneurship, youth training, skilling is definitely one of big priorities for the ILO now constituents. So we certainly will follow up with you and especially also on this uh, uh, program where you use the digital learning because we're also look, looking at how 
the new digital solutions can promote more and better learning uh, among young people, but also among adults. Um, so with this, uh, I would like to also to open the floor for some questions uh, or perhaps comments. We have very little time for this exchange, but let's uh, make the best use of the time. So if you have a question or a comment, could you please raise your hand? Virtual hand. I don't see any hands raised at the moment, but I also would like to draw the attention of everybody to the this uh, very intense exchange in the chat we have because there are plenty of resources, materials and tools uh, shared among participants there. And also in general, I would encourage you to put uh, questions into the chat, even if we don't have time to answer all of them now, we can ask the speakers to follow up with participants on specific questions. Pretty much for the question on the bike for the future. Uh, we do include uh, uh, electrical vehicle, an electrical bike there as an end user. And uh, of course, this is a marginal interest for now. But when we have the vocational training, we do address now the beyond the meter issue. So please uh, uh, write to us, particularly to Maria Caterina, and I put you in contact with the person in charge of the training capacity building vocational there. Would be a good idea. We gave it to Professor Da Silva the first electrical bicycle for him. But thank you for the question. Yes, indeed, end use beyond the meter are also important for electrification of Africa. Thank, thank you very, very much. much, Roberto. Yeah. I don't see more questions for the moment. Um, so let me just maybe say a couple of words of my own conclusions from this uh, fascinating discussion, which I at least, you know, I learned a lot, uh, even though you know, I, I've been working in this area for so many years, but I always discover the new approaches or the new ideas and especially the new uh, examples of specific uh, projects at the operational level uh, that we can pursue. Um, I again encourage you to look at all those wonderful tools shared in the chat. So my first conclusion uh, from the discussion today would be about raising the ambition. I think Mustafa opened uh, the webinar uh, speaking about raising the climate ambition, but then also underlying the importance of uh, the human factor skills to be present in order to meet that ambition. And I would just continue that line of thought. I think we also need to raise the ambition in the skilling pro pro programs themselves in terms of the number of participants we want to reach, access to training. We heard the ambitious program from the European Union to achieve 60%. So perhaps that's something we also need to think. What is the ambition globally to engage adult learners in, into training and retraining? And also what is the ambition to engage young Young people in different types of training, in, including uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship training or training for potential innovation, because uh, youth today will be adult workers for tomorrow, and they are the ones to implement the uh, transition, the green transition climate policy in the future. Uh, we also need to raise the ambition in terms of the quality and relevance of technical vocation education and training programs, because that is the best way to engage uh, young people as well as adult workers into training that makes really interesting for them to participate. And for this, of course, um, partnerships with the private sector, especially the whole process of social dialogue with employers and with workers and coordination of different policies, not only in you know, vocation education and training policy, but thinking about this in the broader context of employment, of industrial policies, environmental policy, technology policy, and how all these policies talk to each other and coordinate among themselves. We also need to raise the ambition in terms of quality of jobs. And for this, again, social dialogue and uh, engagement with the private sector is essential. Some speakers mentioned also the importance of sectoral approaches. And again, that is something 
what brings us to a very operational level. That's where the dialogue becomes concrete. That's where we can identify specific competencies needed for the just transition. But for this, we also need skills intelligence, not only about current green jobs, but also potential green jobs, how the whole composition of skills is going to change across the board. So skill needs anticipation, labor market information also are very important. And then some of participants also mentioned the whole system level change. Uh, it's uh, of course easy to say that we need more social dialogue. It's easy to say we need more coordination, but how to make the change systemic? And for this, of course, we need more capacity building, including the institutional capacity building and institution building where we don't have those. How the dialogue happens at national level or sectoral level or, or local level really depends whether there are some institutional platforms uh, that allow uh, private sector and the public sector, vocational education and training providers with employees and workers to discuss about specific skill needs. Um, many also underline the importance of uh, kind of fusion of skills, not only technical skills, but also soft skills entrepreneurial skills, uh, and only this can really facilitate the innovation. However, the innovation is also a bigger process than just skilling. Of course, skilling is important, but we also need to think about some financing solutions and other support mechanisms, including some uh, advisory mechanisms to support innovation for the future. So these are the short conclusions, um, and I think with this, uh, I would like to um, encourage everybody to to continue this exchange after the webinar and I would like to thank the UN triple C uh, research uh, and the rest for Africa and colleagues from uh, the ILO and the PCCB network for joining for collaborating in um, in organizing this webinar and all participants for joining this discussion today and particularly I would like also to to thank the organizers on on the side of the UNCCC and uh, on the, uh, the side of the ILO my colleagues uh, Tahmina uh, Mahmoud and Heikyang Chun. Thank you so much and to be continued. <laughs>